So we'll look at, we said yesterday there, there, are, there are tasks involved with getting data across a network as opposed to just individual links. And one of those tasks we'll call switching. So we'll talk about it in this topic. And the other one, which is a little bit easier to understand, is routing, finding the path finding which set of links to go via. But before we talk about switching, let's talk about what do we mean by a network. A communications network, we'll call it a switch communications network, but uh, I'll explain some of the terminology we'll use via this example. A simple network to illustrate the components. We have our end user devices around the outside. PCs, any computer that the human may use, servers, any device that we want to allow to communicate with other devices on the, on the network. We may call these stations, generally. So whether it's a server or a, a mobile phone, we can refer to it as a station. Other times we may call it a host. Okay, so we'll use the name station or host to mean the same thing, the, the devices that we want to allow to communicate. But because we don't have links between every pair of stations, for example station A and F, there's no cable directly linking them, then to communicate between A and F we need to send via other devices. And these other devices are shown as the green boxes and we can call them nodes, or specifically switching nodes. Uh, and we'll see some other names in other contexts for these devices, these intermediate devices. Now, at this stage, we'll refer to them as just nodes, switching nodes, or just switches. We'll see why switching comes into it in a moment. So the idea is, if A wants to send data to F, because it doesn't have a link directly to F, it sends to some other node inside the network. So this cloud represents the, the communications network made up of these nodes. The, the lines are links, whether wired or wireless, but some form of link. And we can think that the stations attached to the network and these internal nodes deliver the data from one station to another. One of the problems we said was finding the path. So now from sending data from A to F, we need to send it via these internal switching nodes. Which ones to send via is one question. Do we send 476 or 456 or 412356 to get from A to F? That is what we'll call routing, choosing the best path. And that's the next topic. To discuss this topic, we'll assume that we can choose a path. We'll not say how, but let's assume that when we send data, the path is chosen. It's already known. So, the, so we have stations that want to be able to communicate. We have a network of switching nodes which provide connections hopefully such that any station can communicate with any other station. And you see in this case that that's true. If any station wants to be able to communicate, then they just send into the network and there's always a path to each other station. Some aspects of this network, so we've got stations, nodes. These nodes, their goal is to just send data for other people. Okay. The stations may create data. Okay, so they're the originators of the data. They may be the, the consumers of the data. They receive it and process it. Whereas the nodes, their goal is just to forward data for other people. So they have different purposes in here. Sometimes they may overlap, but often the nodes, their only job is to receive from someone else and send to someone else. Typically, the stations will connect into a node via a point-to-point -point link, which is usually dedicated for that station. So A has a link into node 4, and that link is only for communications between A and node 4. No one else uses that link.
the data from no other, no, no other device travels across that link. Only d data coming from A traverses this link or data destined to A traverses this link. And so we say it's dedicated just for A, this link. Whereas the internal links between nodes, sometimes they will be using multiplexing. That is, they'll carry data from multiple users across the single link. For example, if, if A was sending data to F across the path 4, 5 and 6, and at the same time B wanted to send to E across the path 1, 4, 5, 6, then you're thinking at uh, this link between 4 and 5, it would need to carry the data from two different users. It would need to carry the data from user A and also from the user B. And what would commonly do is use multiplexing on this link such that when A and B send at the same time, it, the data arrives at node 4 and that would combine it using FDM or TDM and send it to node 5 across the single link. So often multiplexing is used internal uh, between the nodes. Usually dedicated point-to-point point -point links are used from stations to nodes. An example maybe if you were using TDM, let's say that the data rate of the link from A to 4 was 1 megabit per second and that was the case for all the station to node links, 1 megabit per second whereas the internal link, say from 4 to 5, maybe the data rate is 5 megabits per second so that it can send data from A to F at 1 megabit per second at the same time be sending data from B to E at 1 megabit per second and to do that this link needs to have a data rate larger than 1 megabit per second enough to support the data from both both sources, both users so multiplexing would usually result in this being a much higher capacity link than the station to node links so that's the the network that we'll deal with or an example of the network we have nodes, stations, links uh, what else can we say? this network often is not fully connected so there's not necessarily links between every pair of nodes. Node 2 doesn't connect to node 7. Node 6 does not connect direct to node 4. So that's a, a cost-saving measure. And we don't necessarily need to have links from each node to every other node. If you can imagine these nodes are spread across the country, across Thailand, they're in different cities, different locations, then you connect usually nearby nodes in, in a manner such that there are usually several paths between any pair of uh, stations so I think in this case from A to F there are several different paths we can take and from B to E there are some different paths that can be taken and similar from other pairs of stations so that it's desirable to have as few links as possible then it's cheaper. But have enough links such that there are usually multiple paths between pairs of stations. Having multiple paths helps for uh, redundancy. Something fails. Node 7 fails. A can still send data to F via 4, 5 and 6. So having multiple paths is useful there. Uh, things like load balancing a is sending via the, or someone is sending data via 476 and the the capacity of the links and the nodes is starting to be reached that is the amount of data going through it is using all of the capacity so A may want to send their data via a different path which is less congested to balance the data not to have all the data going across one path but to balance it across different paths so that you get uh, better performance so that's load balancing so we'd like to have multiple paths but few links to make it cheap so it's usually not fully connected the, the technologies we're about to talk about switching and, and the, the issues we're dealing with 
often relevant for large networks, wide area networks, networks that cover cities, between cities across a country and between countries. It's not necessarily something that we use, at least we don't have a network this complex, say, inside our home. We would only need one such switching node inside your home. It's much simpler. But in larger networks, we may have a, a much more complex net, uh, situation. So, this just summarizes those concepts. Data is transmitted from source to destination through a network of switching nodes, those green boxes. Those switching nodes don't care about the data. They don't care that you're sending a voice communications, a web page. They just treat it as any type of data and their goal is to send it on to get to the destination. We refer to the collection of those switching nodes as a communications network. And the devices, the end user devices, are attached to that network and we can call them stations. Another thing we may call them is hosts or just end user devices. Usually the station to node links are dedicated, they're just used by that station, sending data from and to that station, whereas node to node links may be multiplexed. They carry the data from multiple stations at the same time. And we don't usually have fully connected networks. So the two main issues with how to communicate when we have such a network, which path to take, which is routing. And another is, well, how do the nodes forward the data on? The different modes for how, how to get the data through those nodes, which we'll refer to as switching. The idea is that we'll send data to one node. If it knows the path, you can see node 4 has three different output links. For the data from A to F, if it's going to go on the path 4, 7, 6, then you can think the data comes into 4 and it switches it out to node 7. Yes. Uh, if it was data going across a different path, maybe A to E through the path 4, 5, 6, then that data will be switched to the link to node 5. So these devices we call switching nodes because you can think they have a, a switch in, inside which tells it where to send the data on the output as it comes in. And the way to do that, there are really three different approaches for, for dealing with the data delivery. We call it switching, and we'll go through those three approaches today. The first approach is circuit switching. Who has a telephone at home? Not a mobile phone, but a landline telephone. Anyone? A few people still have them, okay? Or is it you? I'm sure you've used them in the past. So, telephone networks have been around for a long time. Maybe a hundred years, more than a hundred years. So, the telephone was invented, I guess, in the early 1900s, late 1800s. So, telephone networks have been the main communication network in use. Uh, you know, compared to the internet, which has only been around for about 40 years. And we'll see that circuit switching was designed for and, and used in telephone networks. When I say telephone networks, I mean not necessarily mobile phone, but or not using voice over IP, but the ho home landline telephone. So the concepts were of circuit switching are suited to telephone networks. And in telephone networks, what data do we send? Voice. Okay? We're not sending web pages. If, we, if you imagine a time before the internet when we just had telephones, there were no web pages. The data being sent was just voice, people talking. So we can think the data or the application is to make a voice call. So the networks were designed for transferring data, which is voice. They were extended to then support non-voice communications, but the, the main design was around transmitting voice. So let's look at how circuit switching works. The nodes in circuit switching connect 
the original source eventually through the, the final destination. And this is what those green boxes looked like in the old telephone networks. So the green boxes in our network, remember they data comes in, they switch out to one of the output links. In an old telephone network, this is what a switch looked like. The way that it works, say in a local neighborhood, you have a telephone at home, and there's a cable going from your home into a local telephone exchange. Okay, so there's your cable, you're the station, connecting to the telephone exchange, which is the node. And everyone's home had cables going into that telephone exchange. And what happens is, if you want to call someone, you pick up the phone, and you tell the operator, I want to call Steve. And the operator connects, so there's a port here that connects from your, to your telephone line, and a port to Steve's telephone line, and what the operator does is basically connects them together. With a, a cable, connects them together. So that now, when you talk, the signal carrying your voice travels across your telephone line from your home, it goes into the telephone exchange, and then it, it's hard to see, but it goes into one of these cables and then out the other end, and then it goes into the telephone line of the, people, the person you're talking to. So that's the role of the switch. It connects those two telephone lines, yours and Steve's, together. And once they're connected, the data, the voice, just travels from the original source, through the first link, effectively through one of these cables, and then on to the destination. And with telephone systems, that was an analog signal, okay, and, and still is. Uh, so when you talk, an analog signal is sent from your telephone across the cable to an exchange, and then it would go across this cable and then out to the destination link. And the result was, once you'd made the call and, and, and you were connected, as you talked, it's as if you now have a link from your home into the destination, destination's home, the call, callee's home, the person you're calling. And as you talk, the signal that's generated just travels across your link through the switch and then direct through to the destination. It's as if you have one long link in this case. And that's what circuit switching does. The first step is to set up that link, to set up what we call a circuit from source all the way to the destination. And once it's set up, you can communicate. Today it's just done in a digital manner. Okay, so the, these are, are quite old, but some of the, the switches in telephone exchanges are just computing devices that do the same thing, but automated. A circuit switch, someone, you, what do you do? You pick up the phone, and then what do you do to call someone? Press the number. What happens then? There's some waiting for someone to respond. And, and so what's happening in the meantime is when you press the number, that triggers your phone to send a special signal to the telephone exchange, effectively saying you want to call this person. The number identifies the destination. Sends a special signal to the exchange, and the exchange receives that and works out that, OK, I need to connect your telephone line to Steve's telephone line if you're trying to call me. And it does it, of course, inside a computer in this case, and connects, or, or it, it starts to set up the connection, and as it creates that, it sends that special signal to Steve's telephone, and what happens then? It rings. Okay, the, the callee's telephone rings when it receives that signal, and when they pick up the telephone, then that sends a special signal back to the switch. The switch now knows that the the person being called accepts that call, sets up a connection, or sets up that circuit, so finalizes the connection between the two links, and then sends the special signal back to the, the caller's phone, and then they hear the, the, the sound going from ringing to now uh, it's connected. And then they can talk. So that's how circuit switching works. 
there's, let's go to the three phases. At the start, before we send data, we establish a circuit. We call it a circuit because once those links are connected, it's like we've connected a, a, an electrical circuit and we can send a signal all the way along that circuit. A circuit, sometimes we call it a connection. We establish a circuit by sending some special messages from source through the nodes to the destination. If the destination accepts the connection, that is they pick up the, uh, the phone, then a special message is sent back through the same set of nodes telling them that they've accepted the connection and telling them that they must uh, finalize the establishment of this circuit and it gets back to you and that's when you can start communicating. So we establish a circuit first which is really allocating some resources inside the nodes and for the links. And then we can transfer data. So in a telephone network that data you can talk so it can send a, a voice signal. Analog or digital, so the same concepts can be applied for non-telephone networks. And at the end, when you're finished talking, you may hang up your phone, which sends a special disconnect message to the nodes, saying those nodes can remove the circuit. They no longer need to connect from this link to this link. And that disconnect will terminate the circuit, terminates the phone call, for example. So three phases. Establish a circuit, transfer data, and then disconnect. We're not going to cover the details of how you do that in a telephone network or in other networks, just the concepts. Now an important point with circuit switching is that it's, you can think it's all done uh, at the signal level. That is, especially telephone networks, an analog signal is sent across the cables to the nodes, which tell them to set up that circuit. And once the circuit's set up, that analog signal is transmitted across each link to the destination. Yes? Uh, a modem, remember a modem it was about converting your computer digital data into an analog to transmit. So, your, say your dial-up modem or even your ADSL modem connects via the telephone network. Uh, with a dial-up modem, it's like making a phone call. You dial in. You make a phone call from your computer to an ISP's really uh, receiving computer. So yes, that was using circuit switching. With ADSL, it uses circuit switching, uh, well, there's only, with ADSL it's different. ADSL it's just from your home to the, the local exchange and then it no longer uses the telephone network, then your computer data goes out to the internet. So with a dial-up, then it was using circuit switching. With ADSL it's, it's changed a bit. But you don't need a modem for circuit switching, just your own home telephone does that for you. Once you establish a circuit, there's a link from source all the way to destination. Even though it goes via multiple links, the way that the circuit is set up, when you transmit a signal at the source, the circuit is set up so that signal will flow through all links and get to the destination as it was transmitted. Let's, let's have a look at some examples and see some details. Uh, some more examples about a telephone system. Don't worry too much about the names of these blue boxes. So the example here is that we have some people, their home telephones, and this first blue box, this end office, is a telephone exchange. So there are telephone exchanges spread across the city, usually to cover a particular neighbourhood, a particular area. So all the people living in that area have a line going into their local telephone exchange. Here it's called an end office. And in other neighbourhoods there are other telephone exchanges. And of course, Alright, first example, 
A wants to call B. A has a link into the local exchange, so does B. So when A makes the call, it sends a special message to the local exchange, which recognises the person they're calling, B, is also on this local exchange. So the, this is the switching node. Okay? The local exchange is the device which does the switching. And what it does is it effectively creates a connection between A's link and B's link. Or it sets up the connection, tells B, so B's phone rings, when and B accepts, sends back a special message, and that's when the connection is finally established. Once the connection's established, when the person at telephone A talks, the telephone takes your audio and sends an analog signal. That analog signal goes across this cable into the exchange, think it goes across this internal cable and then comes out across this cable to B. So it's as if we now have a link all the way from A through to B. And we just send a signal and it goes right through that link. If C wants to call D, then it's a little bit more complicated because D is not on the same exchange, they're in a different neighbourhood. So there's a hierarchy of telephone exchanges. In this case, this intermediate exchange connects the two neighbourhood local exchanges. But the same concept, C sends a special message to the local exchange saying, I want to call D. The local exchange recognises from the phone number that it will need to go to the, the higher level intermediate exchange, which covers, say, the city. And that goes via a link here it's called the trunk line or a trunk link. And the intermediate exchange recognises D is at this local exchange, so starts to establish a connection, sends it through to D. When D answers, a special message comes back. And as that message comes back, it tells this local exchange, connect D to this trunk. And here, connect these two trunks together. And as the message comes back, connect this trunk to C's line. C knows that D is answered. And now when C talks, the analog signal goes across here, through this exchange, through the trunk line, and flows all the way through to D. Again, as if we have one long cable going from C all the way through to D. That's the idea of that. In, in real telephone networks, there's a, a much larger hierarchy. So you have local exchanges, exchanges in cities, between cities, and so on. So there's a, a global hierarchy of telephone exchanges. A little bit about the trunk line. Again, the terminology is not important for this course. Uh, we're not studying telephone networks, but just to explain the concept. This trunk line would be shared by all the users at this local exchange. Okay, here's an exchange, maybe there are 100 people connected into the first exchange. So when they make calls to people on other exchanges, their data must travel across this one trunk line. So we would use multiplexing here. This line would carry the data from multiple users at the same time as opposed to having a, a single line for every possible user. So the idea is that when we establish a circuit, we must have enough resources to support that circuit, to support the connection. Let's say there are 100 people on this telephone exchange, and that this trunk line has a capacity to support, say, 50 telephone calls at a time. Okay, so each telephone call consumes some of the resource of the nodes and of the line. So there's enough capacity here, enough bandwidth to support, let's say, 50 telephone calls at the same time. But there are 100 people here. So what happens when you establish a circuit, when C calls D, that exchanges 
or more, more generally the switching nodes allocate resources for that circuit saying okay if this connection is accepted then I'll guarantee that we'll have enough capacity to support this this circuit this phone call especially on the trunk lines so this device would do a check when the connection is tried to be established it would check is there enough capacity on this trunk line to support one more voice call? If yes, then it proceeds. And each node would check that. This node would check, is there enough capacity across this trunk to support our new voice call from C to D? If so, everything proceeds and the connection is established. If not, the connection is not established. So, Let's say currently there are 50 people already making a call via this trunk line to somewhere else. Then C tries to call D. What happens? C, there's a special message sent to the local exchange. It, this local exchange that recognizes C wants to call D, it needs to use this trunk line. Currently this trunk line has 50 calls in progress. The capacity is 50 voice calls, so the connection request from C must be rejected. And this exchange or switching node sends back a special response saying, no, you cannot connect. Maybe you get some network busy signal on your phone. Not necessarily the destination being busy, so sometimes you try and call someone and you get a, a special sound that indicates that uh, they, on your mobile you get a, a message, but you, on a landline you get a special sound indicating that you cannot call that, that person because they are busy. Similar, there's the concept that the network may be busy. C tries to call D, but they get some indicator saying that the network somewhere along the line, there's not enough capacity to support your phone call. The call's rejected. You may, may get that maybe in busy periods, maybe around New Year. If you try and call people, it's possible that the network doesn't have enough capacity to, to support one more call. And that's a problem using this approach. It's both a, a, an advantage and disadvantage. The advantage is that we establish a circuit. Once it's established, the resources in that path are guaranteed. They're allocated for C to talk to D. But if, if the capacity is currently full, it means we cannot start a new connection. Okay, so it's good for what the people who have started the call, they're guaranteed to be able to transfer their voice, but it may be a problem if we reach full capacity, we cannot have any new connections. And that becomes a problem if someone makes a call but doesn't transfer any data. It can be inefficient. Let's look at another aspect. Uh, let's try and illustrate one other thing of circuit switching. Here's a simpler network. A wants to, station A wants to communicate with station B. And there are two switching nodes in between. So the path is from A to 1 to 2 to B. Once the circuit is established, I'll not draw that, but once the circuit is established, A transmits a signal. And with circuit switching, we deal with analog signals being transmitted. So I'll try and draw what happens. Once the circuit is established, we can think internal for node 1, there's a link between the link from A to 1 and from 1 to 2. And similar, internal to node 2, it connects those two links together. 
the result is that when the data is transmitted, and if we look at analog data, then A transmits an analog signal. If I try and draw that some sine wave, okay, that transmits along this line. What happens when it gets to node 1? Well, node 1 knows that anything that comes in on this line, as a signal comes in, it knows, because the circuit was established, to send that same signal essentially through the node and out onto this line. And it keeps going, and it arrives at node 2, the signal, the analog signal. Because the circuit's been established, it knows that anything that comes in on this line from 1, which originated from A, needs to go through here and out on this line. And that's my sine wave and eventually received by B. The establishment of the circuit allows the signal to traverse all the way from A to B through the nodes. And it's as if there's now a link all the way from A to B. That's the result of circuit switching. From A and B's perspective, once the circuit is established, from the data perspective, it's as if we have one link all the way through. Okay. Of course there are two nodes in there, but their role are just to receive the signal and transmit the signal across the next link. So from the signal perspective, A transmits and B receives. So in terms of timing, well, transmission delay depends upon how much data we have to send and how fast we send. And importantly, propagation delay, it's as if we just have one cable from A to B. So circuit switching creates uh, a link from a through to B. And now the performance just depends upon the characteristics of that, that link created from the circuit. So in telephone networks this data would be your voice. But it has been used for other non-voice applications as well. And the way that the resources are allocated is that this link, or the circuit, once it's established, is dedicated for the users A and B. If A doesn't transfer, transfer anything, if, it's, if A makes a phone call but stops talking, so no one's talking, then the link is still established. No one else can use it. And that's one of the disadvantages of circuit switching. The advantage is that once the circuit's established, it's guaranteed that A and B can use that. No one else can use it. The disadvantage is if, if it's established, but A and B are not sending any data, then it's inefficient. Because we have this link, or this circuit here, but no one's using it. And the way circuit switching works is no one is allowed to use it once it's reserved for A and B. So circuit switching, I think they are the main concepts that we need to be aware of. A path is established before the data transfer begins. And in doing that, in establishing the circuit, the, the nodes check, do we have enough capacity to support this new circuit? It depends upon the application as to how much is needed. Uh, so they if there is, then they reserve that. And a reservation is that this capacity across this link is reserved for these two users. No one else can use it. That's what a reservation means. So we check if there's enough capacity. If there is, then we accept the circuit. If not, we, we reject the circuit. 
This works well with voice traffic, so it was designed for telephone networks where voice was transmitted. The reason it works well is because with voice, the amount of data that A sends to B and similar B sends back to A is quite predictable. When someone's talking on the phone, one user talks for about 30% of the time, 30 or 40% of the time. The other person is talking for about 30 or 40% of the time, and the other times are no one's talking. Maybe you're waiting for the other person to talk. So for many years of using telephone networks, the people, the telecom companies measure those statistics, and they know quite accurately how much data needs to be sent. Okay, they know that voice occupies a bandwidth of about 4 kilohertz. They know how much time spent is spent talking, so they know and can predict how much capacity is needed, especially across trunk lines. The result is that once you establish your voice call, you can talk clearly to the other person. So designed for voice traffic, sending voice data. It doesn't work so well for non-voice applications like internet applications. With voice, the amount of data being sent is predictable or, or quite, quite stable. What about when you're web browsing, for example? Think of your computer. When you're web browsing over a period of, say, 10 minutes, how much data does your computer send? or receive? Or maybe easier, when does your computer send a message when you're web browsing? Again, when you click on a link, so you click on a link that triggers your computer to send a request. Uh, some web pages of course have some automatic refreshing and updating, so that uh, triggers data to be sent. But with web browsing what happens is usually maybe you click on a link and then you spend a tens of seconds, maybe a few minutes reading the page, looking at it. So during that time, nothing's being sent. So with web browsing and many other internet-based applications, there's usually a lot of traffic needed to be sent, a lot of data, and then nothing for a large period of time. And then another burst of data, and then nothing, because you click on another link, and so on. And it's quite unpredictable. Okay, a different person visiting a different website will generate a different amount of data. So circuit switching is not so good for that because with circuit switching, before we send data, we establish a connection and we reserve resources. No one else can use them. But then if we start to send our web browsing data across that connection, then a lot of the time we're not using it. Only for a small portion of time do we send actual data other time we're reading the web page and not sending and that's wasting that connection, wasting the resources. So it's not well suited to our typical internet data applications. Where is it used? Public telephone networks, so the, the telephone network across the world. Private telephone networks, so say inside our campus we have telephones linked together and a private exchange, a private switching node. And some pr private, there's a spelling mistake, data networks. Especially, or a, a large example is banks. So think of a bank which has branches across the country, it has some central office for keeping all the records, and it has ATMs, thousands of ATMs. A private data network Many banks in the past built private data networks so they connect the branches and ATMs together such that instead of sending voice across that network, they send transaction logs, uh, events from those different locations to keep track of what's happening. So they'd have a network which would connect from ATMs and branch office back to a central office. But nowadays, Circuit switching is only really used in, in telephone networks. New, no new networks really take advantage of it for, for data communications because it's not well suited for applications where the amount of data sent varies over time.
this is just another example with a, a call to through different switching nodes. So with circuit switching, and we'll compare it to the other approach in a moment, but with circuit switching we'll see we reserve resources for a duration of a connection. That's good in that the resources are guaranteed for that pair of users. So we get guaranteed quality. Think of if we use circuit switching today in the internet, if we did, then think that from your computer you create a circuit through to the YouTube web server. Okay? You're guaranteed to be able to transfer at 10 megabits per second for the duration of that circuit. Which means when you're streaming the video, it's always going to be at 10 megabits per second. No one else can use that capacity. It's guaranteed and allocated for you. So it'd be reserved through the network. That would give you high quality. The delay would be quite small. The delay depends really now upon how long the link is and how fast we transmit. It doesn't depend so much about the intermediate nodes with circuit switching. Quality is good, but very inefficient if I establish a circuit, I reserve 10 megabits, 10 megabits per second, but then I don't use it for five minutes. From the network perspective, there's 10 megabits per second of capacity unused for five minutes. For example, I stream a video, then I uh, go on and do something else that doesn't require that capacity. So very inefficient. Another small thing with circuit switching is that the devices use the same technology or the same speed. Think of when you call someone on the telephone, then inside that circuit switching network, both telephones transmit and receive the same form of signal, a 4 kilohertz analog signal. Circuit switching is used in telephone networks, but it does not good for internet applications. So in, I guess, the 60s and, and 70s, as people realized that they want to allow computer applications to send data across a network, they developed new approaches. And, and the new approach is called packet switching. And that's what's used today in the internet. In packet switching, now think of your internet application. It has some data to send from one station to another. So here's our two stations. We have a network. There'll be switching nodes inside. But from the application and, or the station's perspective, they have some data that we want to send. We break it into smaller chunks called packets. In the same way that when we looked at flow control and error control, we took our data and split it into frames. A packet's just a different name. And we send one packet at a time into the network. The switching nodes deliver those packets to the destination. And there are two different variants of how to deliver them. The packets usually contain a header to indicate who does this packet belong to, who is it going to, and also, in what uh, order does this packet come in in the application data? A sequence number, for example. So we'll, we will look at uh, the two variants for how to send the, the, the packets through the network and then talk about, well, why using packets is it better than using uh, circuit switching? What advantage does it have? There are two types of packet switching. Datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. Let's look at datagram packet switching first. And then we'll through an example. And the example is we have a source station, a destination station, and it has some data to send. And the green circles are the switching nodes. 
and the links between them. And what the source station does is it breaks the data, the original data, into multiple packets. Another name for those packets is datagrams. So they have many different names. Frames, in some cases, uh, generally packets. Sometimes we refer to them as datagrams. And we break it, in this example, into three different packets. Packet number one, two, and three. And the source station sends to the first node in order. First sends packet one, packet two, packet three. And then that node will send those packets to the next node. And it will follow some path through the network. The nodes will choose the path. We haven't touched upon how yet. So sometime later, let's say this first node sent the three packets to this second node and packets one and two are then being sent down to this node in the middle. Packet three is still being sent to the second node at some time later. One important issue with datagram packet switching is that packets may take different paths. And that's here. Packets 1 and 2, which belong to the same original set of data, took this path through the middle node. And in this example, packet 3 took a different path. Okay, so that's possible in datagram packet switching because in this case, the nodes treat the packets independently. What that means is if I'm a node, I receive a packet, I look at the destination, all right, it needs to go to this computer, and I make a decision to send it to the, some next node, thinking it will get to the destination. The next packet I get, I do the same thing, but I don't care about the previous decision. So I receive packet number two. Okay, who's the destination? Let's send to the next node. And then I receive another packet and I make a decision. And it may turn out over time that this node chooses to send some packets in this direction and some in another direction. Just because those three packets belong to the same piece of original data, the internal nodes don't care about that. They treat the packets independently. The adva advantage being that that makes it very simple. The nodes receive a packet send. They don't need to keep track of past packets. The result being is that if packets can take different paths, some packets may arrive before the others in the sequence. So packet 3 by chance arrives before 1 and 2 because it took a different path. Maybe this path, the links are much faster and the delay is much smaller such that the packet gets there first. So the result is that this last station, a uh, last node, in this case, puts them back into order before it sends on to the destination. So it must reorder. So that's the disadvantage of datagram packet switching in that we must deal with the fact that some packets may arrive out of order and put them back, back into order. And that's what's used in the internet today. So the internet uses a protocol called IP, the internet protocol, and it uses this concept. The source sends packets to the nodes, and each node receives an IP packet. It looks at the destination, who does this need to go to, decides to send it onto a next node. And they don't care about the, the previous packets. And it makes it very simple, and one of the reasons why the internet became so popular because of the simplicity of that protocol for sending data. Why, why do packets help compared to circuits? What was the problem with circuit switching? How can packets help? What was the problem with circuit switching? Look in your lecture notes, it's written there. Why, 
what's the problem? And then we want to know, well, why use packets? What's the first, what's the problem with circuit switching? Or a problem? Uh, if, you have, if you have to send the large data, you have to send it once, but each packet we can divide many times. Right, but forget about packets for a moment. What's the problem with circuit switching? What is a problem we highlighted? A disadvantage? Again? It can be inefficient in using the resources. Okay. With circuit switching, a good thing is that we establish or we reserve resources. So think of every link when we establish a circuit, some resources are reserved across that. That's good because I'm guaranteed to get some level of performance. But it's bad in the cases that if, if for a short period of time I'm not sending anything, I've got nothing to send, then in circuit switching those resources cannot be used by anyone else and that becomes inefficient. You can think there's a link that has a capacity of 10 megabits per second. I reserve 1 megabit per second. No one else is allowed to use that 1 of that 10 megabits per second. It's reserved for me or for my connection. If I've got no data to send, still no one else can use it. That's the, the problem with circuit switching or a problem. How does packet switching help in that case? So that's the, a problem with circuit switching. Why can packet switching help alleviate that problem? Fix that problem? Well, the idea is that if we break our data into packets and we think over a particular link, if there are many people trying to send data, with circuit switching, each pair of users would have to reserve a part of the capacity. But if at some point in time no one is using that, no one is sending data, it's inefficient. With packet switching, the idea is that as multiple users are sending packets, if one user has nothing to send, then it's likely that the packets of the other user can be sent and utilize that link resource. So it can be more efficient. Let's see if we can illustrate that. It won't be very good, but we'll try uh, some picture to try and illustrate that, or a simple example. Let's say we have We'll focus on a particular link. Uh, what do we do? Here's one node, and we'll have a, another node. I'll explain this in a moment. This is node 1, this is node 2. And we have many users wanting to send, so A, B, and many others. Okay. Wanting to send to others over here, let's say uh, C, D, and so on. And we have a link. So the scenario will focus on a particular link between two nodes inside a network. This link needs to carry the data from many users. from A, say, through to C, from B through to D, and, and others at the same time. With circuit switching, let's put some numbers to this to make it a, a maybe easier to understand. Let's say the capacity of this link is uh, 10 megabits per second.
with circuit switching, we often talk about, say, voice calls, but it's, for us, I think it's easier to think in terms of data rate, megabits per second as a capacity. That's the link capacity. Capacity. That's an I. And let's say, for simplicity, for the numbers, that every... Uh, we're going to use circuit switching first, and then when someone wants to create a circuit, they need to reserve one megabit per second. So they need to reserve one megabit per second, so... with circuit switching first. Think of every application that creates a circuit asks for one megabit per second. How many circuits can we support on this link? Ten. Okay. What would happen, let's say A creates a circuit to C, B to D, so they've reserved two megabits per second. Once we have 10 there, we've reserved 10 in total, 10 different circuits. When another person wants to create a circuit, they send a special message, it gets here, and this node 1 would reject and say, no, my link has capacity for 10. If I've reserved 10 at this point in time, a request for more resources will be rejected. So with circuit switching, that's how uh, we, we allocate resources. Now the problem is, if we have 10, 10 circuits reserved, let's say currently we have 10 circuits open, so we've reserved a 10, full 10 megabits per second. The problem is that with circuit switching is even though this is reserved, if A is sending no data to C, they've reserved a, a connection, but they're sending no data, and similar, maybe B has reserved a connection, but is sending no data to D, then really, the link has a capacity of 10 megabits per second, but at some point in time, maybe we're only using 8 megabits per second. Because even though some have reserved capacity, they're not using it. And that's a waste. That's the, the disadvantage of circuit switching because what could happen if the 11th user came along, if the current use was 10, uh, sorry, if the current use was 8 out of the 10, if the 11th user come, came along, then it would make sense to allow them to use that link. But it's not possible with circuit switching because it's reserved and allocated. So how can packet switching help us in this case? Well, I don't know how to draw it, but these users, same case, the applications want to send one megabit per second. But they don't reserve it. So we still have a capacity of 10 megabits per second, but with packet switching, each user sends packets from their link into node 1. That's my packets drawn there. And similar, B is sending packets at different times into node 1, and so are other users. And what node 1 does is takes those packets and sends them out to node 2. Packets from different users and sends them to node 2. The idea is that currently maybe there are 10, 10 users sending at one megabit per second. So A is sending at one megabit per second, B is, and so on. There are ten different users sending packets at one megabit per second. Then everything would be okay because our link has a capacity of ten megabits per second. Ten users sending into node one at one megabit per second. Node one can send out at ten megabits per second. And that would be okay. 
if if now there were 10 users sending at say slightly less 800 kilobits per second 10 users sending at 800 kilobits per second what comes out across the link if we're 10 sending in at 800 kilobits per second what comes out is 8 megabits per second so during the stages when the users are not sending so much even though they may want to send most of the time 1 megabit per second if they send less then there becomes spare capacity so if there are 10 users sending at 800 kilobits per second the amount we use is 8 megabits per second and we have 2 megabits per second of spare capacity so an 11th user could then send some packets in and the packets for the 11th user could use up that spare capacity and maybe the 12th user so if we don't reserve resources with packet switching what it allows us to do is especially in cases when the users are not sending at the maximum in this case at 1 megabit per second that the spare capacity can be allocated to other users it's hard to illustrate but you can think okay if if B is not sending then it means that we've got some spare capacity on this link and we can use the packets from some other user the 11th user can be sent when B is not sending the idea is that with many internet applications the rate at which packets are sent varies over time sometimes A is sending a lot sometimes they're sending nothing and sometimes B is sending a lot sometimes they're sending nothing so over time if we're lucky what we get is that for most of the time maybe there's a period when A is sending nothing so we can send B's packets and when B is sending nothing we can send A's packets so we can more efficiently share that capacity amongst the users now there's a problem that arises what if there are 11 users sending 1 megabit per second what happens there's no reservation but 11 users start their application to transfer data and they're all sending 1 megabit per second into node 1 what happens well 11 megabits coming in capacity of 10 megabit per second going out not all packets can come out well for a short period of time at least they can be queued here put them in a queue and make them wait until we have some capacity to send them out so that works well in the case when there's a, maybe a small burst of sending for most of the time there's only 10 users sending at a low rate but then there's a, a small ch time when say 11 users sending at the maximum rate 1 megabit per second so we can't of course send it all out so some of the packets would be queued here and wait a little bit and then maybe A slows down and then those queued packets can be sent in the spare capacity so with packets we can adapt in a much more dynamic way so that spare capacity can be used when uh, when it's available and in the case that we reach capacity then the packets will be delayed a little bit they'll be queued and that's where we get queuing delay with circuit switching we just reserve no one else can use it very good for those users but very inefficient when our data sending rates vary that maybe is not the best illustration of the difference but hopefully you pick up with packet switching we can uh, send packets from different users at, and use up the capacity in a more efficient way than if we allocate in circuit switching and it works very well in the internet because in the internet many of the applications send at varying rates sometimes I send a lot then I send nothing 
when I'm sending nothing, you can send your packets. And over for a large number of users, that average is out to be quite efficient. So datagram packet switching, split our data into packets, send them one at a time. There's an alternative called virtual circuit packet switching. Use packets and have the same advantages in that we can be more efficient in using the link, but try to pre pretend to be like circuit switching. So we, we create virtual circuits. Remember with circuit switching, with real circuit switching, before they send data, they establish the circuit. There's a special message to establish the circuit amongst that set of nodes. In datagram packet switching, there's no such process. We just send the packets. With virtual circuit packet switching, we establish a virtual circuit first, say from one source to a particular destination, and then send the packets. And one difference that we see with this example, let's say our source station has already established this circuit or this virtual circuit along this path. Then in virtual circuit packet switching, the packets that the source sends follow that same path always. They will not take a different path, which is different from datagram packet switching and that the packets may go in different uh, directions. This has the advantage in that A, the packets take the same path, so we're, we're likely to get reliable or predictable performance as opposed to sending in, in many different paths. And also has the advantage is that we inform these nodes in advance that we're going to send packets through them so they can allocate resources. In datagram packet switching, when a node receives a packet, it didn't know it was coming. So it's very simple with datagram packet switching, but there's no advance notice that you're going to receive, uh, I don't know, one megabit per second for the next five minutes. With virtual circuit packet switching, we get some advance notice at the nodes that there'll be packets coming from this source for some duration. We can plan better. What's the problem with virtual circuit packet switching compared to datagram packet switching? What's the disadvantage? The other links are not used. That is, uh, we always use this one path. It, that can be a problem in that if this path becomes busy, okay, it gets, uh, because there's also packets, so be careful, this path may still have packets from other users, it's just that the packets from this pair of users take this path. But if it becomes busy, then we cannot redirect quickly the packets to another path. Yes, correct. Other problems? There's a delay upon startup. You want to transfer data. With virtual circuit packet switching and also with circuit switching, we first send this special message to the destination and get a response back. Then we send our data. With datagram packet switching, I just immediately send data. So the delay upon startup can be an issue. Next week, so we'll just summarize some of those advantages for today. Next week, we'll look at some issues of packet size. Uh, and this, we'll look at this example in a bit more depth, but this is a, some timing, and you see on the left, circuit switching. In the middle, virtual circuit packet switching. And on the right, datagram packet switching. There's a delay to set up the connection. Take some time to get our special message from source to destination and the response back. Then we send data. Same with virtual circuit packet switching. Take some time before we send the data. With datagram packet switching, just send the data immediately. That's good because there's no delay upon startup. We'll do a little bit more analysis of that next week.
and do some calculations there. And I think we'll stop there. So next week we'll, we'll return to those two uh, slides about the timing, do some example calculations, and then summarize some of the trade-offs between these three switching techniques. <laughs>